Hi, my name is John Dexter. I'm the creator of Alpha Dogs and the new comic book series, Dime Store Detective. Find me at Real Alpha Dogs on Twitter, Alpha underscore dogs underscore comic on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook as well. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator and writer of an amazing comic who is just getting back from a comic convention. So I'm sure he has a very busy weekend ahead of him. So I'm just going to jump right into it. We're joined today by the ever talented John Dexter. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing today? It's a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure meeting you as well, too. And of course, I should say the, the creator and writer of Alpha Dogs and of course, Dime Store Detective. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, that's going to be, it's not out yet. It'll be on Kickstarter, uh, probably in August, maybe September. If they, Kickstarter isn't, doesn't like you running two campaigns at the same time. So I'm, I'm either going to have to do Dempster Detective first or Alpha Dogs issue three. I haven't, I'm not sure. Depends on where they are uh, in development. The, the, the struggles of running a Kickstarter campaign or a yeah. crowdfunding campaign, go figure. But it's a good yeah. problem to have, I think. Yeah, yeah, it can be. It can be. It's it's kind of a roller coaster ride, but it's been a lot of fun. So, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. The creator and writer of Alpha Dogs, and as he said earlier, uh, Dime Store Detective, which will be coming out soon on Kickstarter. I've uh, been writing for, for well over 20 years. I first started out as a struggling screenwriter and had a little bit of success. Nothing. To bragged about too much. But then after that, I started developing Alpha Dogs about six years ago. It was my first Kickstarter and it was uh, quite a journey, but it's been uh, quite rewarding. I was able to fund issue one. And then back in March, 2022 here, I funded issue two. And issue three will be coming out in September. And then shortly thereafter, before will be a Dime Store Detective on Kickstarter. So tell us what Alpha Dogs is all about then. Because it, it, it's a beautifully drawn comic and, and it looks to be well written from what I've, I've briefly been able to see as well too. Yeah, yeah. So Alpha Dogs is about these two dogs. The main character, Buck, is a pit bull who's got a really great heart, but he's feared by the public because of his breed and size, which was inspired by my own dog, who's a pit bull mix himself. And we had the choice of either getting rid of the dog or moving uh, because they had outlawed pit balls in my town. And we moved, of course, because we we're going to get rid of our dog. It's like our own kid. And that was kind of the uh, genesis of Alpha Dogs, this big pit bull that uh, is feared by humans because of the breeding size. And he has the ability to um, heal from most any wound. And he's smart enough to understand human speak. And he has a slightly heightened strength. Him and his owner, Ina, and this old grumpy pit bull who shares the same powers as Buck have been on the run for most of Buck's life from these mercenaries. And finally, they settle down in this small farm in South Carolina where they think they'll finally be at peace. But the dog's owner, Ina, brings her new boyfriend over and introduces him to the dogs and divulges the dog's secret, something that she's never been, but she's lived an incredibly lonely life protecting these dogs. But little does she know that her new boyfriend already is aware of the dog's abilities and has developed this um, formula that once in possession of the dog's blood, he can create his own superpower dogs with their own distinct abilities. And he's on a revenge mission uh, that we slowly unravel as the story goes along. Looking at your, your journey, at least for all the dogs, what's the hardest about, hard about creating this story? Was it the beginning, the middle, or the end? Writing, I'm sure probably most writers will tell you, it's a very fluid process process and it just as soon as you start writing and you got a good concept and know what you're doing it it goes pretty smoothly it's just the editing of course is a very arduous process and it gets very old and boring but you have to just keep going over it and going over it until it becomes a well-oiled machine we want to put out something that's going to be very popular and very well received so you just have to do the work and that's really what it's about writing as they say is rewriting really that's a struggle in itself sometimes the the blank page staring at you and the blinking cursor and all that yes kind of. it is it is definitely but once you get started it's kind of a runaway train hopefully for most people <laughs> so does writing energize you or does it drain you creatively oh no it's it energizes me i love it well that's when i feel complete is when i'm 
creating uh, the story. It's a lot of fun. If it's work, then it's then it's no fun. You're probably doing something wrong if, if you look at it as work. You know, if you have to sit there and stare too much at a blank page, you probably should just put the pencil down that day and do something different. Because once you get going, you should look at the time. So, oh my gosh, it's been two hours. I thought it's been 10 minutes. The hard part really is getting word out there and trying to get people to interested in your story, especially, you know, because of the COVID age, you know, comic book conventions came to a halt. And when they started, they started very slow and a lot of people didn't attend them. So now it's starting to get more in full swing. I can't do any comic book signings or anything like that because of COVID era. That definitely has hurt a lot. As you were, we were speaking of earlier uh, off air, Twitter and Facebook, they have the algorithms where they try to protect their people from what they consider spam when you're trying to advertise your comic book. So kind of difficult in that way too. You got to be creative. <laughs> this is my first comic book convention with a table for Alpha Dogs. I did a comic book back a good 10 years ago and I had attended one comic book convention. The comic book I did called Steelhawk. Uh, like I said, it's been a good 10 years now and that was my first one. But this is my first comic book convention. With Alpha Dogs, I did pretty good. I mean, yeah, of course, the economy is kind of taking a downturn, so people are not spending like they were six months ago. For nobody really knowing Alpha Dogs, I did pretty decent. I was happy for the most part. I'm pretty sure I sold more than everybody in my line. Look back and forth to see how other people were doing, and I seemed to have the most interaction, but I also was the only person standing. I think it's important to stand. I stood the whole time. It was as interactive as I could. So what was the fan reaction to Alpha Dogs and your other works on the table? Well, Alpha Dogs was the only work on the table, except for I had an advertisement for Dime Store Detective. I had a poster for Dime Store because even though it's not out yet, I kind of wanted to start the ball rolling with getting people uh, interested in it. People were very uh, enthusiastic about it. They love the art. I mean, that's what brings them in is the art. They don't know what the story is yet. People were very impressed with, with the art. I had a nice big poster and... One guy was pretty cool. He was in a Deadpool costume and he came up and said that he was inspired by it when I told him the story of the dog. He felt like he was talking to a famous person, which I had to laugh because I'm definitely not that. And then today, someone had, who had bought the comic book uh, the day before, he had to come back and talk to me and said how much he loved the book, couldn't wait for the third one. And so I was able to collect quite a few emails for people to be alerted for issue three. So that was cool. I, I was very happy with the feedback that I did get. So out of issues one and two, because I don't think you want to spoil issue three just yet, but what was the hardest scene for you to write in both issue one and issue two? Issue two was difficult because it's you have to give some exposition and I hate books with exposition. So I was forced to with issue two. I tried to do as best I could explain the formula. So I waited until issue two because I didn't want to do too much uh, speaking exposition exposition issue one so i really started issue one off with a bang and got people interested and then in issue two once they were hopefully interested and hooked i was able to do a little bit of you know talking between the characters so they understood the formula for creating the dogs give some backstory on the relationship between uh, the dog's owner and her new boyfriend i don't like exposition any more than I have to because it really bogs down the story. And if you do it right, your images should tell the story. And hopefully I did that. So hopefully it wasn't boring for anybody. But that was a difficult part. You got to set up the story. Uh, like, for instance, this year with Stranger Things, the new season, I the first two ish episodes, I was like, gosh, this is kind of not that great. But they were just there was a lot of setup. And once it got going, it was, you know, balls to the wall. <laughs> it was a very awesome, awesome uh, series. But I mean, it's the old film adage of, of show, don't tell, really. I mean, exactly. That's the, yeah. the best part about, about comics is you have the ability to to tell and show almost simultaneously mm -hmm. too. It's smart to use as much juxtaposition as you can. When you have to speak and do some explanation, you've got something exciting going on with the images to keep people interested. I don't do too much narration in, in my comic books. I think your images should be able to do that. And if you can't, then you're probably doing something wrong. But speaking of images, you have a great team around you as well too. Is that correct? Yeah. You have uh, an amazing artist and, and letter. Who's working with you so that we can give proper kudos? Yeah. So the team is from Stone Tower Studios. They're out of Argentina. And I just did a cattle call on uh, Facebook, uh, writers looking for artists a few years back. A bunch of people submitted their stuff and nobody came even close to them. They were just awesome. 
uh, as you can tell once you look at the comic book. But Fernando Malik is the artist. Lucas uh, Art uh, Urita is the project manager. He does also does the lettering. Ezekiel, I'm going to butcher his last name, so I'm going to attempt it. <laughs> he does, uh, does all the coloring. They're an awesome team. Very, very happy with what they've done. First issue, issue three, they've sh- shown uh, me the first page of it. And it's, issue three will start off with a pretty big uh, bang. I was going to ask then, um, when you gave the script to them and you got the artwork back, was there a scene that you wrote that the artwork just made it way better? Most of everything, especially the cover, um, it's always so thrilling when you have something in your mind and you write it down, you explain it, and then they take it and make it to the next level. I sent you the image for issue three cover with the one dog and I said well I wanted Ina the dog's owner and the old pit bull off to the side and then they put him in the middle with her with the gun and him jumping up and I thought oh gosh that's even better than what I imagined it was cool yeah so they've been able to take everything for the most part and just make it better than even I I thought it could be check out the issues you'll probably agree that the art is is pretty amazing and the covers really really grabbed me for sure from what I've seen and and I I thought they were just amazing they they really kind of set the tone for what you're expecting and, and it, it looks like it's a very action filled comic series so far yeah it definitely is the cool thing is they thought it was had a lot of action in the first two issues wait till issue three that's when things really blow up issue one and two set up for a big certain climax for issue three no. No, all the cards are on the table with issue three it is issue three the last one to tell the whole story it's gonna be close to 40 issues so oh, wow <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a little bit so. But the first storyline, first volume, if you will, is about eight issues. And then we go to the next one. About five volumes in all when it's all going to be said and done. So Omnibus, hardcover, something like that in the future? I haven't tried to get a publisher yet. and So maybe after issue three, I'll try so I don't have to wait so long for issues. Because if I do just Kickstarters, I'm going to be like 80 before they're done. So I got to figure something out to get these out a lot faster. The first one, it was a year in between. And then for issue three, it's going to be six months. So I'm hoping I can cut it down to, you know, every four months if I'm able to, if I'm able to get these funded and actually start making money on them. Because I haven't made any money yet, as most probably Kickstarter people will tell you when they first start out. Razor thin margins, eating ramen out of a, of a paper cup, pretty much. Yeah, and I'm going for punishment because I'm doing another comic book series. So <laughs> but this one's going to be a limited issue. It'll be about probably six to eight issues. I haven't planned out exactly how many issues it's going to be, but I have about seven pages completed for for issue one of Dime Store Detective. Can you talk about Dime Store Detective? Or? So I've always been a fan of the film noirs, mm-hmm. the pulp novels, that whole genre like Maltese Falcon and I don't know if anybody's familiar with Raymond Chandler he was a very famous probably one of the best American writers of the last 70 years with his writing I started reading his books and I became instantly enthralled and I thought man I gotta write a det- I've always wanted to write a detective story and I came up with one many many years ago and it was a totally different um, story but the title was the same. He was a detective who left the detective agency in the 40s and wrote um, pulp dime store novels. He was horrible at it, <laughs> but he was a good detective. So I took that concept and then I had another a detective story. And then recently I finally was able to bridge them into a really, I think, a terrific story that people are going to really enjoy. And I describe it as it meets true detective. It's a supernatural mystery thriller that spans over 40 years about these murders that this detective in North Georgia investigates. And when he comes to the crime scene, the person was is murdered on the same grounds in the Appalachian Mountains that the detective's father and uncle buried a bunch of bodies. They had a still war, a bootlegger war back in 1981, where these this rival group of bootleggers went to basically war with his father and his family. And there's a connection there between the murders of, that are happening right now. And this, uh, he's not a demon. He's not a, he's just this evil entity presence that is around. Not to give too much away, but he inhabits the story as the bad guy. Sounds like a fun time. And I definitely can't wait to see when it, when it comes up. Like I said, I was, I've always been a fan of it, those other supernatural kind of movies. They don't get too, you know, they leave a lot of things open of 
the concept of what it is, this being of pure evil. And I wanted to do a hard-boiled story in the vein of Ella Confidential, Maltese Falcon, but I felt to add the supernatural element will make it extremely original, and I don't think there's ever been a detective story in that vein of the pulp fiction, pulp novel stories with a supernatural element. So I think people really enjoy it. I don't think recently there has been anything to, on that level, that's for sure. But it's great to see. I mean, it's a genre that I don't think a lot of the younger generations really know about. No. They're very interested as it is. So to bring a new generation into reading that type of stuff, I think will spark some incredible interest in that genre. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, you know, genres that are dead and, you know, people just forget about it and then something really good comes along and it sparks back up again, kind of like Unforgiven when the Western were dead for so many years, then Unforgiven was made and all of a sudden there was tons of Westerns. So then in your opinion, what is the most important quality of a writer in today's comics and how does that translate to what you've created? I would say is is learn, read a lot, watch movies a lot keep your mouth shut and your ears open. <laughs> you don't really know. I mean, you should always be learning as much as you can. You know, really good writers will say, you know, you should always be a shark, you know, always be moving and not stagnant because there's so many terrific writers out there that you should be learning from. I mean, the first and foremost is Stephen King's on writing book. That was a huge benefit to me. Raymond Chandler, as I was saying, you know, he was one of the best writers out there with quick way to dialogue and try to keep explanations down to a minimum. If you're a comic book writer, Alan Moore, of course, you can't go wrong with him. <laughs> you know, he's the king. I mean, as a writer, you never, ever master it. You never master being a writer. You always, there's always something to learn from it. You know, they say a screenplay is never completed. It's just abandoned. And that's very true. So what is your creative kryptonite? I would say it's too much of a creative crypto is just getting people on board, keeping on the artists to bring pages out, keeping on them. I have to bug them a lot. You know, I wish I had the comics all finished up now, but just money, of course, trying to raise the money uh, to make your dreams come true. You can't wait around for somebody else to do it. You got to kind of, that's the great thing about Kickstarter is there's so many terrific writers and artists out there that would have never seen the light of day if not for Kickstarter. I mean, myself included, I wrote to Image and some of these other places pitching my comic book and I, they never gave me the time of day. Kickstarter has been a lifesaver, really. No excuse really for anybody to say, oh man, this is the reason I'm not a writer. This is the reason I'm not this. And there's no excuses anymore because if you have the means and everybody does, I, I don't believe anybody can't make it happen. If you just, you just got to work your butt off. That's all. But it, it's time, patience, and, and perseverance is what it boils yes. down to. If you don't take the time to hone your craft, if you don't take your, the time to promote yourself, like shows like this or on social media or whatever, it's easy to get discouraged in no matter what endeavor you're, you're doing, whether it's comics or a show or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I created Alpha Dog six years ago. <laughs> so that tells you anything, you know, and it was just, it took me a year to raise the money to get going. And then even that it still took another year because I was having to raise the money as I go per page, but anybody can do it. Yeah. And there's a lot of independent publishers out there as well now too, if, if you're looking to be published. I mean, there's been a lot of things coming out of SourcePoint Press, Band of Bards, a variety of others that I've run across over the past few years. And mm -hmm. they're putting out amazing stable of, of comics, no matter the genre. SourcePoint Press had a big booth here at the Lansing Comic Con that I was at. They were, they were out of Michigan as well, so yeah. big presence there. And they had a lot of interesting books. I just got volume two of Good Boy recently. So that was their take on the John Wick with anamorphic dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious about the writing process specifically, because you said you talked about you were writing scripts for films. You had some success with that, and then you switched to comics. Was that transition an easy transition for you? Yeah. And if you read Alpha Dogs, you'll see it's very much a, a cinematic comic book. You know, it's very much something that could be adapted to a Netflix series or a movie. That's just how I write. It's how I learning to write since I was. 15 years old when I wrote my first screenplay. Read books by famous screenwriters and watch a lot of movies, of course, watch the classics. It wasn't too bad, but yeah, I mean, writing a screenplay is much more of a technical aspect to it than people realize. You know, there's beats that you have to hit in a screenplay or they don't even look at you, which is a little bit of frustration too, that it's so technical that you, unless you're Quentin Tarantino, you can't go off 
script, no pun intended, <laughs> for it. So I had wrote a screenplay called The Weeping Trees that was a fiction, historical fiction script back quite a few years ago now. The people that put on the Oscars, the Academy, semi-finalists, there was 7,000 200 screenplays and I was able to make the top 180 two years in a row with that script and so I've had high hopes that it would get developed. I went through a lot of process of starts and stops and eventually I just it didn't work out and then I said you know I, I have this concept for alpha dogs but I'm gonna create it as a as a comic book. Now with the advent of Kickstarter I thought I could just do it all myself. I didn't have to worry about somebody else making my dream come true. I'm just going to take the driver's wheel and do it myself. If you could see this as a live action, like a Netflix series or something, do you have any any ideas as to who would play some of the main characters? I mean, the, hmm. maybe the voices for the dogs then? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, obviously, they probably have to have gruff voices because they're dogs. I've always liked Brad Pitt's voice a lot. Uh, he did narration for uh, Cormac McCarthy, the guy that wrote the road. He also read, wrote my all-time favorite book, uh, Blood Meridian. And he did narration for some of the books and he has a pretty cool voice. He would be one. I have to get Hugo Weaving because, you know, he does like the voice of everything nowadays. But Nick Nolte, maybe he has a pretty gruff voice. Yeah, I would probably not be part of that process anyway. I was able to sell it to somebody, so. They have Super Pets coming out as a film and they have they Keanu Reeves and Chris Rock and all these others. Those are some voices you never would expect to be as best <laughs> yeah i miss the old school they hired actual voice actors not celebrities yeah. like rocky and bullwinkle bugs bunny and you know mel blake they did all the voices i i think that was that's kind of a dying art they just hire celebrities now but i much prefer actual uh, voice actors what was an early experience where you learned that language had power oh my gosh that's a really tough question <laughs> boy well, this is kind of not a very good answer, but probably uh, the Star Wars movies, I guess I'd have to say, you know, the power of the force, all that that combined. And it's evolved as I've gotten older with the metaphysical world, meditation and all that realm that I think it now encompasses. But I always was fascinated by that uh, growing up. Sorry, it's the best I could come up with. This is the first movie I've ever seen. I'm not a deep person. <laughs> <laughs> so then what is an underappreciated novel that you read early in life that you went back to and thought, you know, this was actually better than I realized? Well, Blood Meridian or even in, of Redness in the West is Cormac McCarthy. So when I first read it, it wasn't all that famous until The Road came out and me, that Cormac McCarthy became such a huge, 72, written so many great novels. Nobody really knew. He wasn't all that famous until The Road came out. And then uh, the other one, No Country for Old Men, really blew him up. Blood Meridian, when the first time I wrote it, I thought it was really awesome. And then I went back and listened to the audiobook and his use of metaphors and similes and just the writing in general was really great. And I really appreciate it as I got older that it was even better than the first time I read it. The only reason I had reread it the second time was just because I was like, wow, he's become extremely famous now because of the road. That would probably be a one that I'd come back and appreciate it even more. Now I've reread it and re-listened to it probably eight times because it's such an awesome, ins inspirational, uh, sad story. Yeah, that was a good question, man. That was a stumper. It's still not, not the best answer, but it's all I could come up with at this moment in time. There's mo mostly, you know, stuff that's underappreciated. I read it, uh, watched it. It's still underappreciated. People have just forgotten about it as time went on. Like, uh, there was a recent one now. Of course, I can't remember the title of it. It was one of Alan Moore's favorite comic books. It was a terrific comic books in black and white about the Depression and about the need for unions. Uh, it, took, it takes place during the 30s, during the Depression. Of course, I cannot recall the name of the book, the comic book. I read it this year. Yeah, I cannot recall the name of it. But anyway, it's a terrific story that it's been forgotten. People should read. At what point are we good enough? I don't know. David Boyce is something really, really prolific. He said that the shame is it isn't until you're old 
that you become the person you were meant to be. So that always kind of stuck in my mind that, you know, you do a lot of growing in your life and isn't until you're old that you become the person that you were meant to be. So hopefully people realize that and can get past a lot of uh, the hangups that they have when they're younger. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? People haven't given me too much advice, to be honest. <laughs> Pretty much I've learned how to learn everything the hard way. <laughs> But uh, I guess just never stop persevering, I guess. Don't give up on your dreams, you know, um, because, you know, I'm in my 40s now and I started writing when I was 15 years old. And I thought, of course, I was going to be this famous writer by now and I'm still working at it. So I guess never start giving up because I'm... Alpha Dogs hasn't been a huge success, but it's getting there and people are really responding. And I'm hoping that a few years it, it will become uh, something that a lot more people will enjoy. And I've had almost nothing but really good reviews on the people that have read it. I guess m my second <laughs> basic advice would be never give up on yourself. So what's the most misunderstood aspect? when you tell people you're a writer? Probably that they just think it's like a hobby. <laughs> you know, uh, people think it's your hobby and don't realize the passion that you have for it and what it takes to be a writer. They probably just think you just sit down and plop down your, your thoughts and feelings. And in reality, it is it is kind of a lot of work. It should be that there's a lot that go into it. And, you know, it's not a hobby. It's, it's your passion. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they're today. Who was that for you? So I'd probably be my, my grandpa Brown. He was a World War II vet. He was a very happy-go-lucky guy. I got married, lived a pretty good life, and then his wife died of breast cancer. And he kind of gave up on his dreams and settled in and became a postman. He had always wanted to be a writer and do big things and stuff. But unfortunately, because of his wife dying, he kind of gave up on life and settled in just being a postman and drank a lot and smoked a lot. So I always wanted to kind of become a writer and do good by him and things that he probably would have wanted to do. And he was a decorated World War II vet that always made me very proud. From a professional standpoint, you have created Alpha Dogs and you are working on the third issue for a Kickstarter campaign as well as Dime Sword Detective, which will eventually have a Kickstarter campaign. And you're at comic convention, so professionally you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was, uh, I had ADHD. I had a math disability. People didn't really expect a whole lot of me. I've been able to go from just working a labor jobs. Uh, I ended up became an, becoming an inspector for buildings and stuff. It's had some prestige with that. I've been able to take all the disappointments from trying to make it as a writer and keep on going, even though it was been somewhat of arduous task to have some success with alpha dogs and have a, a little bit of a following uh hopefully it gets even a bigger following so yeah i'm i consider myself a uh, success even if it ends today to have as many people have i had have come up to me or wrote to me and said how much they enjoyed alpha dogs and being dog lovers themselves and empathize with the main character dog that's feared by the public because of his breed and size and actually has a great heart and is willing to help humans even though they fear him. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? I've had many, 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 many years of failure, so I'm very familiar with them. For many years, trying to break into the screenwriting, getting close, and then it all falls down. Having a lot of those, the comic book, you know, taking six years to, for Alpha Dogs to get produced. Uh, you really just have to get up and brush yourself off and say, you know, tomorrow is another day. And what's that famous king that says, um, this will, this shall pass. That's something I've always kept in mind uh, whenever I've had devastating news personally or uh, professionally. I just think, well, tomorrow's another day and it will not be as bad tomorrow and won't be as bad the next day. So that's kind of how I try to combat it. Because if you just live in wallow in self-pity, you really don't get anywhere because nobody's going to come in and save you. You really, you're basically on your own on this and you have to keep going on because the alternative is wasting your time on doing what you don't want to, don't want to do or not something that you love. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a, as a writer or comic book creator, or maybe it's something 
creative in their own way. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think probably to help them and not be too judgmental. Uh, unfortunately, with social media, people love judging people and condemning them when they have done nothing much of merit themselves. And I think that it's better if you don't enjoy what somebody's doing or just to keep it to yourself or find something positive about what they've done and created to help push you along and just kind of have some suggestions without saying something negative about them to help them because you don't really grow that way with just having negative uh, reinforcement to kind of pick things that they've done that's that's good and then help them to grow by uh, giving them some suggestions and hopefully they're smart enough to take it and uh, learn from it and not just be mad and walk away. <laughs> if your life was a film or a comic book or whatever medium it may be, what would its title be? And because I like music, what would its soundtrack? People even know this. R Running Down a Dream would be a good song. Dream the Impossible Dream. It's from uh, La Mancha, Man from La Mancha. <laughs> that would probably be the soundtrack of To My Life, <laughs> to Dream the Impossible Dream. I guess the movie title would be, uh, it's another song title, but it works as uh, Don't Stop Believing, I guess. Good uh, name, because that's kind of how my life has been. Uh, song titles for films works out very well, I have to. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I do hate to say this, John, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Heavy, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? And of course, where can we find Alpha Dogs and, and Dime Sword Detectives in the future? Yeah, so you can contact me via Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. I'm on, uh, for in Instagram, it's alpha underscore dogs underscore comic. On Twitter, it's at real alpha dogs. And I'm on Facebook. Or you can just Google John Dexter Alpha Dogs. You can all sorts of places as you can uh, look to probably contact me but those are the easiest ones and i'm also in some comic book stores i'm in uh mishawaka kalamazoo and battle creek right now currently i'm gonna probably get to more comic book stores but uh, also the kickstarters so uh, that's a great way to buy my comic books whenever they're on kickstarter you can look them look me up too the easy the fast way would probably dm me through facebook uh, john dexter or um Instagram or Twitter. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com <laughs> forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And if you could hit that subscribe button, I would greatly appreciate me trying to hit my goal of a thousand subscribers before the end of 2022. And we're just over halfway there. So I appreciate all the help. And we have a Patreon as well, too. So patreon.com forward slash TGT Media. Support the channel. Uh, as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking. Thank you.